What's up everybody, my name is Andrew and you're watching the top 10 tips for visiting Alaska. Now you've seen these videos before so you know the drill. A bridge version, itinerary in the description below. If you want to skip to certain parts of the video, check out the time frames that I've included. I do have to warn you though, I only talk about South Central Alaska because that's the only place my wife and I visited. If you still want to watch, sit back, relax, crack open a beer and enjoy the video. Number 10, summer is funner. More fun, summer is more fun. The optimal time to visit Alaska will really be from mid-June to probably mid to late July. Number one, it's gonna be warmer. You're looking at highs anywhere from 50 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit and lows from 30 to 50. So that's pretty nice weather. Number two, less snow in the lower altitude. So when you're driving, you're hiking, or you're walking, you don't have to worry about slipping on snow. Number three, less rain. Even though you're looking at the forecast and it's saying it's gonna be sunny, still be prepared that there's a chance that there could be rain. Christine and I ran into some really, really bad luck and we had multiple days where it was just overcast and rainy. Furthermore, the days are so long during the summer in Alaska. Honestly, you really only have three or four hours of nighttime and darkness, which is insane. That really provides you for a long day that you can travel and do so many different things. Your day really never ends. Most importantly, summertime is peak bear and whale watching season. This is when the whales migrate up from Hawaii, when the bears come out of hibernation, and when the salmon run starts. So if you wanna go whale watching, bear watching, or salmon fishing, going during the summer is the best time. There is one negative to going during the summertime, and that's the mosquitoes really come out from June to August. And if you're someone who attracts mosquitoes like me, then get ready to bring some bug spray. That's probably not gonna help. Just get ready to be bitten. Now, if you're looking for more of a Northern Lights, winter sports, ice fishing, not being around as many people type of experience, then I recommend going during the winter time. But if you're a typical tourist like my wife and I, and you wanna check out all the touristy things that Alaska has to offer, 100% go during the summer. Number nine, packing list. I will preface this by saying there is a Costco in Anchorage, Alaska. So anything that I say in this list that you don't have, you don't want to fly with, that you just want to buy there, um, Alaska probably has 95% of what I'm about to say. I'm going to start with the skin products. Bug repellent if you're going during the summer, and sunscreen if you're going to be out and about, which I suspect you will be. After that comes your normal winter gear, so beanies, gloves, mittens, extra pairs of socks, if you're going on hikes, I recommend packing in layers because the weather in Alaska is so unpredictable. Always be prepared for the rain. Hiking boots, hiking poles, hiking backpack, a canteen to keep water cold. Pack some summer clothes as well too because like I said, the temperature can get up to even the 70s or 80s at time. So t-shirt and shorts are definitely key. An eye mask would be a good idea as well um, in case the place that you're staying doesn't have blackout curtains. Binoculars for wildlife viewing, a video camera, a GoPro, a camera, extra film, extra memory cards, extra batteries because you're in Alaska. You're gonna wanna capture everything that you see. Couple of things that you're not gonna need to pack. Bear spray, you definitely should not pack because the airports will confiscate that. You can't fly with bear spray. They sell them at Costco, two for $40. Fishing waders or knee-high boots. If you're doing one of those fishing excursions, they will provide those for you. Ice crampons, you're also not gonna need unless you're doing an ice hiking excursion or something like that, which I would expect they would provide for you. And lastly, Formal clothing, you'll notice that you know normally jeans and a button-up is probably good enough. You're never gonna go anywhere that you need to actually wear a full-blown dress, slacks, or button-up, unless you're going to Alaska for a wedding. Number eight, drink a beer. I'm gonna start by talking about the breweries in Anchorage because that's where you're gonna find the majority of your breweries. 49 State Brewery is the most popular one, the one that you're gonna hear about the most. Honestly, not our favorite though. Good bar food, you know, probably worth the hype to check out one time. Um, but when it came to beers, subpar beer. I would say our favorite though is easily Midnight Sun. My two favorite beers there were the Snowshoe White and Wine About Wit. The Snowshoe White's kind of your typical Belgian wit beer uh, with an orange peel taste, cumin, coriander. But the Wine About Wit was special because it was a double wit beer that was aged in Chardonnay barrels. Next, we go to the city of Soldotna where we visited two breweries, Kenai River Brewing and St. Elias. St. Elias was probably the lesser of our favorite. They had some good pizza, their beers were okay, but Kenai River Brewing had a bomb chicken sandwich. And on top of that, my favorite beer in Alaska, the Honeymoon Hef. It's a very refreshing Pilsner-like beer with a little bit of a fruity flavor to it. 
perfect for a summer day. Now we go down south to the city of Homer where we actually only went to one brewery there called Grace Ridge Brewing. It was a mom and pop run brewing company. It was very cozy, very cute, had some good beers. So on a cold day in Alaska, definitely recommend checking that out. We did go to another bar, not a brewery, called Salty Dog Saloon. It's one of the most famous dive bars in Alaska. It's dark, it's stinky. Um, they only sell bottles of beer. You never know who you're gonna see, the types of people you're gonna find in there. And then there's dollar bills all over the side of the wall. Next, we're gonna go a little bit east to the city of Seward to Seward Brewing Company. And to be honest, I would not recommend going here. It's more of a restaurant, but even then their food is not that great and their beer just does not hit the spot. Last, one of our favorite breweries is Cooper's Landing Brewery. It's located on Highway 1, just north of the Kenai Lake. They had an IPA called the Hazy Anglers IPA, the perfect juicy tropical bitterness of an IPA. If you're asking me to rank my top three favorite breweries, I'd probably say number three would be Kenai River Brewing in Saldotna. Number two would be Cooper's Landing Brewery on Highway 1, and number one would be Midnight Sun Brewery in Anchorage. Number seven, seafood. I'm gonna keep this one pretty short because it's pretty simple. If you eat meat and you're in Alaska, eat seafood. The top thing that you're gonna eat there is the king crab. It ranges anywhere from 60 to $90 for a pound, which is crazy when you really think about it. Um, but it is really fresh and you're in Alaska, YOLO. Next, salmon. Now I recommend going for king salmon over sockeye salmon. King salmon's meat's just a little bit more tender, a little bit more buttery. Um, it's gonna be ranging anywhere from $30 to $40. The next fish in line is the halibut, caught in South Alaska. Generally runs about the same price as salmon, about $30 to $40. The texture of meat's a little bit smoother than the salmon. Other types of seafood that aren't as popular but still caught in Alaska would be shrimp, uh, rockfish, and the Pacific cod. There were a few restaurants that actually stuck out among others, and one of them was in Anchorage. Uh, called the Crow's Nest. It was located at the very top of a hotel called Hotel Captain Cook's. Uh, Christine got the salmon and I got the pork chop. It was excellent. The next restaurant is located in Homer called AJ's Old Town Steakhouse. I got the ribeye and Christine got the halibut. Both were delicious. And I can't stress the importance of planning ahead and making reservations for nicer restaurants, especially during summer months. Number six, take a hike. There's plenty of hiking all throughout Alaska, but I'm really just gonna focus on Anchorage because that's where we did the majority of our hiking. Chugash State Park is a huge state park that encompasses a big part of Anchorage. And within that park, there are hundreds of trails. The most popular one by far is called Flat Top Mountain. It's about a 3.3 mile round trip hike. And I would say it's probably one of the hardest hikes that I've ever been on. First mile of Flat Top is not too bad. I would say it's probably an um, easy to moderate hike. You start walking up flights of stairs. I don't know how many, maybe like 30 or 40 flights of stairs. And you get to a point where you look up and you see the flag at the very top of Flat Top, but there's really no obvious trail. The rocks are marked with this little orange spray paint, which helps you kind of follow the trail. I would say for the majority of that, Christine and I were on all fours. And we got to points where you really had to balance yourself against the rock because if you missed the footing or slipped, you can actually really hurt yourself. But for the most part, as long as you're being smart, you're not climbing with one hand on the rock and one hand on the GoPro like me, um, you should be okay. Once you make your way to the very top, it is very, very much worth it. It really is a flat top, but it's so beautiful. It was raining the whole time. It was overcast, as you can see in these videos. But even with all that, it was still a gorgeous view. A couple of other hikes that we didn't do that I wish we did if we had more time was called Mount Baldy and Rendezvous Peak. They're both moderate, both around three miles round trip. Regardless of where you go for hiking, just bring bear spray with you. And I was reading through alltrails.com and I was going through each one of these hikes. There were mentions of bear sightings at every single one of them. Another thing Christine and I really enjoyed doing that was not a hike was actually the 20 mile Tony Knowles bike trail in Anchorage. Um, it's actually very cheap to rent a bike. It costs us $15 each for two to three hours and pretty much you're gonna need three hours at max for this entire trail. You're pretty much biking along the coast of Anchorage the whole way, but then halfway through, you're actually zoomed through the trees and you have very good chances to see moose. As you're biking along and you see beautiful mud flats to your right, do not get off your bike and try to take a picture or step on these mud flats. There have been numerous reports of people getting swallowed by this quicksand and actually dying. People will recommend that you do the whole 20 mile loop that involves going through the city. I actually don't recommend that for numerous reasons. Number one, you're just going through the city, you're not seeing any beautiful views, it's just Anchorage. It's really not that pretty. Number two, you probably will get lost. Christina and I found ourselves being lost. She started yelling at me, her bike brake malfunctioned, that led to more yelling. Just was not an ideal situation. 
Um, so I recommend when you get to the very end of the trail, just to backtrack. Who knows, if you didn't see a moose on the way there, you might see one on the way back. Euglerus Brewing, Spotted Cow. Great beer. Only can buy in Wisconsin. But it's halftime, you know what that means. Beer time! <sighs> Spotted Cow. Hits the spot. Get it? Number five, Gaze at Glacier. can't go to Alaska and not at least see a couple of glaciers. So I'm gonna give you a list of a few glaciers that Christine and I visited, and then a couple of other ones that we didn't get a chance to see. We saw the majority of the glaciers in Seward. When we went on the Kenai Fjords tour, I'll talk a little bit more about that in depth later. Eilick Glacier, I'm sorry if I'm ruining the name, and Holgate Glacier. Um, we parked our boat within probably 100 yards of this glacier and just sat there and listened. And every 30 or 40 seconds, you can hear part of the glacier falling and hitting the rock. Um, and it was just such a cool sound and it was really, really cool experience in general. Also in Seward, there is Exit Glacier. Um, this is about a 2.2 mile round trip hike. It's very easy. But with that in mind, I would still wear your typical hiking gear. I think because it was a very populated, very famous glacier, we saw so many people getting out of their cars with sandals, uh, jeans, and no bear spray, which is crazy to me because just that day, there have been three bear sightings on the Exit Glacier Trail. The last glacier that we saw um, was actually in Mount Denali itself, and it was called Ruth Glacier. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail later on, but pretty much we took a small jet, flew around Mount Denali, and stopped and landed on the glacier. It was such a surreal experience. I highly recommend it if you have the money. And lastly, two really famous glaciers that we didn't have the time to see, Porter's Glacier and Byron Glacier. If you do have the time and you wanna see more glaciers, I highly recommend checking those out. Number four, go fish. We did our fishing trip in the city of Soldotna. I'd recommend either doing it there or in Kenai. The reason is because the Kenai River and the Kasseloff River are the two big rivers that you can find salmon on, and they're the ones that run through these cities. I highly recommend doing the full day, eight hours, versus the half day, because you just have more chances to catch fish. It takes a lot out of you, but man, it's really, really worth it. There are two types of salmon that you can catch, king salmon and sockeye salmon, and the modalities for catching them are completely different. For king salmon, you have bait on your fishing hook, and you leave your fishing hook out there and you're sitting in the boat in the middle of the river. For sockeye salmon fishing, you don't have any bait, you just have a hook, and you're constantly throwing your fishing pole out there and pulling it back, throwing it, pulling it back. When you have these big runs of salmon, when there's hundreds of salmon coming by, and you're hoping that your hook will catch on to one of the sockeye salmon. Sounds kind of far-fetched, but um, I hooked at least four salmon, and ended up catching one. Christine hooked three salmon, and ended up catching two. When we saw people afterwards at the end of the day who went king salmon fishing, we did not meet a single person who caught any king salmon. So I think it really just depends on the time of the day. You don't have to worry about not having any experience, not having any equipment, because Christine and I had zero experience and zero equipment. They lent us these knee-high boots. Wear extra, extra socks though, because your feet will be cold. But besides that, just go prepared to have fun. Now in terms of what to do after you catch the fish can become a little bit tricky. For us, our company was nice enough to fillet the fish for us, but in terms of cutting it, packaging it, sealing it tight, and freezing it, and then overnight shipping it back to San Diego. When all was said and done, that was about $170. It does sound really crazy, it is a lot, but if you really think about it, we had about 10 pounds of salmon. Each pound of salmon maybe costs anywhere from 10 to $15, plus the experience, it's probably worth it. If you don't wanna pay that much and you wanna bring your own cooler, you can still pay those companies to process, package, and freeze it for you, which will probably only be about $30. And then when you're ready to pick it up, put it back in your own cooler and then ship the cooler home. The only caveat with that is you need to be leaving from the same city. For us, we did the fishing in Soldotna and we left from Anchorage. So it wouldn't make sense for us to drive back to Soldotna, pick up our fish, drive to Anchorage, and then ship it off. Um, for us, it just made more sense to overnight at home. Number three, bears, beets, Battlestar Galactica. Wildlife in Alaska, everyone's dream or at least my dream. I'm obviously gonna start with the most popular animal that everyone wants to see when they go to Alaska, and that's the bear. There are three types of bears found in Alaska. Polar bears, black bears, and brown slash grizzly bears. They're pretty much the same species, so I'm just gonna refer to them as grizzly bears. You're not gonna see any polar bears in South Central Alaska, so throw that one out of the list. The most concentrated amount of bears is gonna be Denali National Park. 
um, at least in the south central area of Alaska. The weird thing about this is the grizzly bears in Denali are actually not brown. They're almost a light golden color. They almost look like golden retrievers. We ended up taking a tour bus, I'll talk about that a little bit later, deep into the national park. And unfortunately, we're only able to see two grizzly bears that were very, very far away. If you truly want to see grizzly bears up close, I highly recommend taking one of those private tours to either Lake Clark National Park or Katmai National Park. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the video. The next most popular animal is the moose. A lot of them are concentrated in Denali National Park, but not only that, they're also along the side of the roads. They're huge. They basically look like big tree trunks that move. So if you're driving and you see big tree trunks that are moving, put on your hazard lights, slowly pull over and you'll see these moose. Other types of animals, wolves, doll sheep, and caribou, are mainly going to be concentrated in Dalali National Park. Now moving from land animals to ocean animals, um, we saw the majority of our ocean animals when we did the Kenai Fjords tour. Again, I'll talk about that later. But the animals that we saw include humpback whales, sea otters, sea lions, and puffins. We were even lucky enough to see a whale breach in front of us twice. Lastly, bald eagles are literally everywhere in Alaska. I've never seen this many bald eagles in my life. I think Christina saw maybe 20 to 30 bald eagles. Number two, be a nomad. I think one of the beauties of Alaska is that every city has a different scenery to offer. So one of my biggest advices that I can give is that if you're gonna visit Alaska, don't spend all your time in one city. Be a nomad, rent a car, drive to multiple cities and look at what each city has to offer you. You can probably read the itinerary below, but you'll know that Christine and I flew into Anchorage, spent two days there, went north to Denali National Park, spent another two days there, drove all the way south to Homer, spent two days there, went back up north to Sedultna, spent one day there, and then went southeast to Seward and spent two days there, went back to Anchorage and flew out from there. Honestly, one of my favorite parts of Alaska was just driving through the state. Um, whether you're going down Highway 1, the Sterling Highway, the Seward Highway, the scenery was just always changing from mountains to oceans to forests. It was truly, truly beautiful. Keep in mind when you're driving, there's lots of construction that goes on on these highways, especially during summertime. So plan that in to your trip. Number one, visit national parks. You cannot go to Alaska without at least visiting one or two or three or four national parks. I can probably do an entire video just on Denali National Park, but I'll try to keep this short and give you the main key points. Now, Denali National Park is special because they really try to preserve it. And by doing so, they really only allow uh, the public to go the first 15 miles into the national park. That being said, there's still plenty of hikes that are to be done within this first 15 miles. You can still see plenty of wildlife, but to truly get the full Denali National Park experience, you should take one of those bus tours that take you further into Denali National Park. They range anywhere from $100 to $150 a person. They're not the most exciting tours because you're pretty much in a bus the whole time, but truly to get the best chance to see what Denali has to offer, potentially see grizzly bears, moose, wolves, all those other types of animals, I do recommend doing these bus tours. That being said, there is a small chance that you can actually drive your own vehicle the rest of the 96 miles and not be cut off in the first 15. Denali National Park does open their park up to the public for five days. And during those five days, they allow 400 public cars to go through each day. This raffle starts a week after Labor Day weekend and you can actually do it on recreation.gov. So interestingly enough, you actually can only see Mount Denali from Denali National Park about 30% of the time. And that's because the majority of the time there's overcast, it's raining, it's just really hard for you to see the actual mountain. And Mount Denali is the tallest mountain in all of North America. And if you're gonna be in Alaska and you're gonna be in Denali National Park, I would recommend you make sure you see this. One way to do that is by taking an excursion of one of those small planes that leaves from Talkeetna that flies to and from the mountain. There are different types of packages you can do. Christine and I did the one where you flew to almost the top of the Mount Denali and you did a glacier landing. That was about $450 a person. These excursions range anywhere from $250 to $500. It's just pretty much what you want from it. These planes leave from a small city called Talkeetna Another city south of Denali that I also recommend going to if you're gonna stop by Denali National Park. It's a cute city that has a brewery that I forgot to mention and also multiple restaurants and a little cute ice cream shop. Next is Lake Clark National Park. So I touched upon this a little bit earlier, uh, but this is a national park that you can only get to either by boat or by plane. And majority of the time it's by plane. It's located a little bit north of Katmai National Park. And these two national parks in Alaska have the highest concentration 
of bears. And I'm talking grizzly bears. These excursions range anywhere from $650 to $800. So this is a very, very pricey experience. But for me, like I said, seeing bears was number one on my priority list. So I knew I had to do this. These planes fly out of Homer and it's about an hour to an hour and a half to either Lake Clark or Katmai National Park. For the most part, the company that you're flying with is going to determine which one has the best weather and which one has the best opportunity for viewing bears the day of. A little bit scary at first because these planes are even smaller than the planes that you fly around Mount Denali in and you have to land on the beach. But once you're there, you're literally walking amongst grizzly bears. As I mentioned, Christine and I saw about 28 grizzly bears as close as 10 yards from us and as far as about 30 yards from us. The reason why these grizzly bears don't pay attention to uh, humans and aren't hostile towards us is because they have an abundant amount of clams um, on the beach that they're eating. Um, as a result, they don't see us as food. That being said, our tour guides were still very, very experienced and I never once felt unsafe or felt like I was going to be threatened by these bears. Last, Kenai Fjords National Park. I touched about this a little bit earlier, but the Kenai Fjord tour is probably one of the coolest things that we did. It's a boat tour that's about six hours, takes you out all throughout the Kenai Fjords through Resurrection Bay, two glaciers, and you see awesome, awesome wildlife during this time. It's about $150, $175 during this time, and it's well worth your money. Even though we had really, really crappy weather the day that we went, Christine and I still enjoyed it a lot. The lunch they provide is really, really bad. Um, they do give you baked cookies, and they do sell beer, which makes up for it. But if you're looking to eat a full lunch, I would just pack my own lunch and bring my own food. One thing that I can't stress enough about this boat tour, though, is that if you're gonna go on it, make sure you take anti-nausea or motion sickness medication. I would say about 50% of the people that went on this ended up getting motion sick sickness, and we saw them putting their heads down or vomiting over the side of the boat. And this pretty much happened the entire tour. So imagine paying $150, going on this thing for six hours, and then spending the majority of the time vomiting or feeling sick or sleeping. So if you're gonna go on it, do either a scopolamine patch, take Dramamine, or take Zofran. Be prepared because there is a lot of swaying that goes along with this tour. So there you have it. Those are the top 10 tips for visiting Alaska. If you like what you saw and heard, please hit the like button below. Leave me a comment and subscribe. Christina and I are visiting Smoky Mountains in less than a month and I'll be posting a top 10 videos for that as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, stay safe, stay kind, and get vaccinated. Baby, won't you meet the light?